Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hopefully, uh, everyone can hear me. This is Andrew Farr. I'm the Associate Editor of Water Finance and Management, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Water Finance and Management webinar series. Uh, so if you're here for the webinar this afternoon, you're in the right place. Uh, today, we have a great presentation lined up. Uh, if you've joined us in the past for a Water Finance and Management webinar, uh, welcome back. Uh, this is your first time. Thanks for taking some time out of your afternoon. Uh, glad to have you here. Uh, a lot of the webinars we've presented this year uh, for, for Water Finance and Management are you know, kind of topics along the uh, water distribution side of things. So we're going to change gears today and uh, talk about sewer system uh, project evaluations. And our sponsor today, Environment One Corporation, is going to talk to us about using the life cycle cost calculator for sewer project evaluations. Uh, so we're going to get into uh, several things uh, on that on that point. Uh, you know, how much does a sewer system cost? Uh, what are the life cycle costs of that sewer system? And uh, kind of the cost analysis and comparisons of, of pressure sewer systems uh, as compared to more uh, conventional gravity sewers. Uh, so uh, as everyone is uh, logging on with us, uh, just a couple housekeeping items. Uh, we're going to take a quick poll uh, as, you, as you log on right now. So uh, please submit your answer, and then uh, you can click the blue Return to Presentation button. Uh, the poll just helps us uh, get a better read on uh, you know all of our attendees and who's on with us today. Uh, I'd also like to mention that uh, you know any views or opinions uh, expressed in the webinar today are those of the presenters and don't necessarily reflect those of Benjamin Media. Nor does Benjamin Media endorse any products or, or methods mentioned. Uh, but I do like to say that what we do uh, encourage and endorse is a good forum for discussion. Uh, and uh, exchange of information, and uh, that's definitely what we'll have here today. So with that, we encourage uh, everyone on with us to submit questions. Uh, you can do that uh, by typing questions into the uh, questions panel, which you should see on the left-hand side of your screen. You can also maximize that viewing window by clicking the box with the X at the upper right-hand corner, and that will, like I said, maximize that viewing window. Uh, as you look at, as you submit questions. Uh, so without further delay, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our presenter, uh, Keith McHale, who is the INI Project Manager for Environment One Corporation. Keith has more than 30 years of experience in manufacturing and consulting engineering focused in wastewater collection and treatment. Prior to joining E1, Keith worked as a consulting engineer in several capacities from a staff engineer to a senior level project management in the areas of evaluation, planning, and design of wastewater collection systems and treatment of and disposal facilities. Uh, so Keith has a, a, a ton of experience in uh, sanitary sewer evaluation, surveys, uh, I and I evaluations, gravity sewer design, pumping station overflow evaluations, and pressure sewer system design. So Keith, uh, whenever you're ready, go ahead and uh, take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. I appreciate that. And uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, our presentation, our, our webinar today, is on using the life cycle cost calculator for sewer project evaluations. Uh, this life cycle cost calculator is a tool that we developed here at E1 uh, to allow uh, users to, uh, to facilitate the evaluation of pressure sewer systems uh, and other sewer system alternatives. So. On this webinar, we're really focusing on the cost calculator. I'm not going to get into a lot of information on uh, pressure sewers or uh, you know, some of the cost advantages, where it really comes in, you know, some of the differentials. We can address that in the questions. But we did do a, a webinar with uh, Water Finance Management last year, and that webinar is available on our website that goes into a little bit more information on you know, what is a pressure sewer system. So we're kind of starting assuming that you're all comfortable with uh, at least the concept of different sewer systems, and this is a tool where we will evaluate the life cycle cost of those concepts. So you can check out, um, you know, certainly check us, uh, send in any questions if you need additional information on the systems, or check out our uh, YouTube page uh, for uh, the, the prior webinar that we did that went into a little bit more detail. So when we look at, you know, a, a sewer system evaluation, it can be very important when you're looking um, 
to consider what you're going to do for your long-term centralized sewer needs to include a life cycle cost analysis. And what a life cycle cost analysis is an, econ is, is an economic analysis that utilizes both engineering and financial inputs to compare alternatives. Uh, certainly when you're looking at various types of sewer system alternatives, you might start with the purely economic or I'm sorry, the uh, purely engineering evaluation. But it's important to look at both the near term and long term costs of those sewer alternatives to make sure you're giving the stakeholders the um, you know the best bang for their buck. Uh, and what the life cycle cost analysis does is evaluates both the present cost of the initial capital construction, as well as the future costs that are necessary to operate and maintain the system. Uh, and it provides that long-term uh, assessment for um, operating the system versus just the initial capital cost. So it's, 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 it's one of those things where it's uh, both simple and maybe a little complicated or a little, uh, I don't know if tedious is the right word, but it might take a little bit of work. But basically, the information that's required for life cycle cost analysis would be the initial installed capital cost, any project cost that you want to include, and those would typically be defined as um, project administration costs, maybe the construction administration costs, any costs that are borne by the utility to move the project forward that could or could not include the engineer costs. You know, it's kind of one of those flexible terms that everyone's going to have their own idea. But you might want to include those initial project costs. And then you have your annual operation and maintenance cost. And when we look at sewer systems, it's also important to consider the cost of infiltration and inflow. Because with gravity sewers, it's not a question of are you going to get infiltration and inflow into your system. It's when are you going to get it and how much are you going to get. And there is a cost associated with that uh, infiltration inflow into the system. So it's important to kind of catch that too. Otherwise, you might find yourself down the road having this cost that nobody planned for because you have all this excess infiltration into the system. In addition to the uh, cost components, you also have some financial criteria such as the cost escalation rate, uh, the discount rate, which brings all monies to uh, or discounts it to the current value, and then the project planning period, how long you want to evaluate the period for. So the, the life cycle cost is commonly expressed as either um, uh, present worth or net present value. And on public works infrastructure, really the, the primary difference between the present worth and the net present value is the inclusion of the salvage value. So if you're looking from a strictly um, accounting standpoint and you have a pipe that has a useful life of 100 years but you're only evaluating over a 30-year period, you would have that salvage value. But realistically, I've never seen anyone go back and dig that pipe up and really capture that salvage value. So we're looking really at the present worth. And these are all the costs that are outgoing, as I said, the initial capital cost as well as the um, uh, recurrent cost. So your cost includes your initial capital cost, your, as I mentioned, the initial engineering, legal, and project administration costs, or your project cost. And those are all pretty much already in current year dollars when you do the evaluation. Then you're looking at the recurring operation and maintenance costs. These are the costs that you're going to see every year for the operation and maintenance of the system. And you also have future repair and replacement costs. Now, the future repair and replacement costs uh, can really cover a lot of uh, a lot of product. There might be if you have a large pump station, you're going to replace a pump every 10 years, or you might do uh, an upgrade every seven years. So these are costs that don't necessarily occur every year in the future, but at particular uh, milestones. And those are hard to capture when you're looking at a model like we're going to present here. So what I like to do in those future repair and replacement costs is simplify it by treating those as just as an annual recurrent cost. So looking forward after the initial capital construction, you have your recurrent operation and maintenance cost, and then your repair and replacement cost uh, that will be treated as a recurrent cost. So that would be an annual number. And you take that number that's in the future and bring it forward to the present worth using a uh, uniform series present worth formula. So you know, pretty standard formula for uh, life cycle cost analysis. Another thing that's really important when you want to consider a life cycle cost analysis is that it should include all operational parameters. As I already mentioned, 
you want to make sure you capture the cost of transport and treat any infiltration and inflow that you might see in a gravity sewer because that is the cost that is going to occur down the line. Also, you want to capture costs such as uh, sewer inspection and cleaning. You know, one of the things that we hear, uh, I would say, way too often is people, when they talk about gravity sewer, they see one of the benefits is that uh, once installed, gravity sewer is free. And that's not the case. You do have that uh, inspection and cleaning that has to be done on a regular basis with sewer systems. Uh, many times in life cycle cost evaluations, that cost is not captured. So it's important to include that in it. Then you also want to include any cost you have with lift station and other components within the system and any mechanical equipment that needs to be replaced. Also, you want to make sure you have a proper or a, a good planning period. Um, you know, the infrastructure is going to have an expected design or service life, but the planning period that you would use for a life cycle cost analysis may not match that uh, service life. Um, typically, an optimum planning period would be between 20 and 40 years. In many cases, that will be dictated by the uh, person who's paying for it. If, it you know, if you're taking out a bond, the life cycle cost analysis will probably match that bond period. Uh, one thing I want to emphasize as we get into this is the cost summary level of accuracy. We have a, um, a model that we put together, and as, you, as we go through this, you'll see that it provides a very good planning level number with very little information. And the AACE International, which used to be known as the American Association of Cost Engineers, has developed uh, five levels or classes of cost estimates, with level five being based on the lowest level of project definition. And when we look at our life cycle cost analysis, uh, this would be considered a level five uh, estimate. Uh, and this is just kind of a quick table that details really quickly. We'll just you know, kind of uh, gloss over this, but you can see with the class five cost estimate, cl cost classification rather, the project definition is very low, zero to two percent. So this is v based on very limited information. And as you progress down towards the class one, you're starting to get more and more uh, project definition. So what we will do with our electrical cost calculator is come up with an initial concept level planning number, but it's going to be based, as you'll see, on very little information. So because the project is not that well defined, it will be considered a class five. Now, as you go through your process, you might start to get a little bit more information and you can better define the project. And that might move you up to a project definition of one to 15%. So then you might be looking at a, a class four. But it is important to recognize that the cost classification is very uh, um, is based on a very low project definition and should be used primarily for concept screening. So that's kind of the, an overview of life cycle cost analysis. And as I said, we wanted to develop a model to help um, engineers and owners, you know, kind of evaluate their systems. And when we looked at it, we kind of defined some of the key objectives and keys to success for a life cycle cost model. And when you're doing a life cycle cost analysis, a couple of things that you really want to address is you want a system that is repeatable so that when you do a life cycle cost analysis throughout various projects, you're using the same processes. Uh, you also want something that's flexible. Uh, you know, every, every system is unique. Um, and you want to have something that you can adjust and make modifications to as necessary, and you want to have some flexibility in that. You also want something that's localized. Um, you know, I've seen many cost models. You know, there are other cost models that have been developed, and I've seen some where they use sort of a national average or national information, and you don't have any uh, localization. Uh, certainly what it costs to construct a sewer in one part of the uh, country or world is not the same as what it might cost in another one. So you want to be able to have the system or the cost model be localized. And then uh, probably I would say almost most importantly, you want it to be defensible. Uh, and this is both in terms of, you know, the engineer or the municipality that is looking at doing the cost model, as well as us in developing this um, cost model for you all. If you want something that you can say, here is, you know, how we got to this point, and here is the backup for that. And one of the things that we defined as defensible is within this cost model, every parameter, as you'll, as you'll see as we go through this, can be changed. So while you may not agree with our, our assumptions or someone else may not agree with your assumptions, all of that can be changed. And if you change it, then you can defend it. So 
I'll go into now our uh, life cycle cost comparative model. Uh, this is kind of a PowerPoint presentation of a walkthrough of the model. Uh, because of the, uh, the format we have, we can't actually, it's not easy to really go through the model. So I'm going to kind of simulate what it would be like going through there. So when you open our life cycle cost model, which can be downloaded for free off of E1's website, and I think there was a link on the um, webinar registration page, if you haven't you know, downloaded that, I you know, strongly suggest you download it following the webinar, and you can take a look at it and you know, kind of work through it. But when you open it, the first thing you're going to see is what I would term the disclaimer screen. This screen kind of explains what our life cycle comparative cost model is and what it is not. Um, some of these bullet points I think I've already mentioned, but it's, it's uh, you know, never, uh, you can never say it too much. So what the life cycle comparative model is, is a planning level tool that provides an assessment for the total cost of ownership between pressure sewer systems and other sewer alternatives. As I mentioned, the results are only intended for comparison purposes only because the results are going to be based on very limited information. Now, within that information, we have um, formulas within the model where these results are calculated, uh, taking into account standard system parameters and unit costs. Then we'll look at what this life cycle cost model is not. It is not a 100% design opinion of probable construction cost and should not be used for budgeting purposes. You know, as a, um, you know, Andrew mentioned at the beginning, of my, you know, prior to joining E1, I do have a history of, uh, on the consultant engineering side. And one of the things we were always taught in you know, my um, consultant days was never give a number that you don't have to because some council person somewhere is going to put that in the CIP for next year. So it's important that we emphasize that you're doing this cost model to do a comparative analysis based on very little information, and because it's not well-defined, it cannot be, or should not be, rather, used for project budgeting purposes. As you develop the project further, after you make that initial assessment, and you get some final quantities, you can still use this model because this model has a lot of flexibility, and you can better define it, and then maybe you can start going down that road. But the final quantities and opinion of probable construction costs can only be determined following um, the selection and the design of the sewer system. So once you look at this um, screen and you hit the Got It button, it will open up the project information sheet. The project information sheet uh, has two primary blocks, and this is what you see when you first open the um, model. Uh, the first block, the project information block, contains 13 user entry fields. Uh, so this is all the information that's really required to do the initial uh, assessment. And really, when we look at these 13, only two of the um, blank fields shown here are critical, and that's the number of service connections and the distance between connections. Uh, then we have the block next to that is the evaluation parameter block. Um, and here you can select what you want to look at. So you can look at E1, gravity, septic tank effluent pump systems, or vacuum systems. And then a little bit more on the evaluated systems. So when you look at what, parent or what systems you're going to evaluate, the default setting is a evaluation between pressure sewer systems and gravity sewers. You could also select to include septic tank effluent pump systems or septic tank effluent pump systems and vacuum sewers. The way the model is set up, it's not possible to preclude step sewers without include, I'm sorry, to preclude step sewers and include um, vacuum sewers. So you have to look at um, vacuum in step if you want to look at um, vacuum. Uh, also, it's not possible to complete an analysis that excludes gravity or pressure sewer systems. Another uh, component in this block is E1 and septic tank effluent pump power. Uh, again, as I mentioned, you know, I'm not going to go into a lot of uh, detail or any detail really on what is a uh, pressure sewer system or any other sewer systems. But E1 grinder pump systems and septic tank effluent pump systems have a pump that is on property. By default, 
the power costs of these pumps are not included in the life cycle cost evaluation. Um, and this is because typically a life cycle cost evaluation would uh, only, the cost would only be attributed to uh, the utilities that are including the results. Now, a purist might say that a true life cycle cost now should, should capture every cost, even if it's borne by somebody else. So the user has the ability to select to include those costs. Um, and again, you know, if you do that, it's the cost, the power cost for uh, E1 grinder pumps is, you know, marginal that it's not going to move the needle on the evaluation. So as I mentioned, there are two components that are really critical in the evaluation. That's the number of service connections and the distance between connections. These two numbers are used to calculate a concept level length of sewer main. Uh, assumptions that are made for this is that the number of connections um, and the estimated sewer mains is the same for all options. There's a service connection on both sides of the sewer main. And there's also an adjustment factor that is provided for uh, variability in the systems. So if you see the note card on the bottom left-hand part of this, you could just, you know, kind of a quick uh, uh, example. You have 210 connections with 145 feet between the connections, and we have a pipe allowance of 50%. Now, this pipe allowance is something there because we don't build sewers on perfect grids. So you calculate it out, that 210 times the 145, and then you divide that by 2 because you have a connection on each side, and then multiply that by the 1.5. So it's a pretty simple calculation it does, and you can see for 210 connections, 145 feet typical between the connections with a pipe allowance of 50% would give us 22,838 feet of pipe. Now, if you have a situation where there's a lot of variability between connections or you have a lot of places where you don't have a connection, then you could increase or decrease as necessary the um, pipe length allowance. And the other part on the project information sheet that you want to include would be the evaluation year, which represents the year of the present worth, the project commission year, and this is the year where the project will start. Why this is important is when the project starts is when you start to incur those operation and maintenance costs. And then you have the planning period, which is given in years, and that's um, the period that you would do the evaluation, as I mentioned uh, earlier, the, the planning period. Um, for the life cycle cost analysis. Now, when you open the comparative cost model, you may not have an actual project that you're looking at. So we included this little button here where you can select some sample data. And the sample data can be imported and provide a quick demonstration to show you the calculation and allow you to kind of play around with it to get comfortable with the model. So here we'll go ahead and click that button, and you can see that those fields are populated with our sample data. Now, I kind of gave away part of this earlier. We have 210 connections and 145 feet between those connections. We put in a postal code that is um, for Niski, New York, which is the, um, our location at, at Environment One. And then our evaluation year, construction year, project commission year, and the planning period. So on the data, that is all um, put populated in there. Uh, if you have an actual project, you put in your project values in those fields. And once you do that, you click on the View Results button, and that will bring up the Results Summary Sheet. So here on the Results Summary Sheet, you have the information for the evaluation. And one of the things we did on the sample data as well is we included all four systems. So we have an E1 pressure sewer system, gravity sewer system, step sewer, and vacuum sewers. Uh, the Results Summary presents in a tabular and graphic summary of the life cycle cost analysis. Uh, the graph and the data table are dynamic. You know, as we work through this presentation, I'm going to show you how you can change different parameters. When you change those parameters, those changes are reflected dynamically on this cost summary sheet. Also, only the sewer alternatives that are selected for evaluation are displayed on um, those sheets. So the summary display includes the capital construction cost, the total operation and maintenance cost, as well as the net present value. Um, so you can select, you, you can uh, elect to display any combination of those parameters on the graph. 
they're always going to be shown in the table, but you might want to just show the capital cost on the graphic illustration. So that's your result summary. So that's kind of the, the quick version to get to. You put in very little information, as I mentioned, the number of connections and the distance between the connections. And the model calculates based on certain um, formulas and parameters that are in the model, an estimate of what quantities you have within the system and what that cost is. So once you get your um, results on this, your next move would be to jump to the navigation dashboard. And you get there um, by clicking on the menu tab on the upper left-hand corner. This button is on every sheet, and that brings you to the navigation dashboard. The navigation dashboard, um, as I mentioned, can be accessed from all pages and basically just allows you to jump around easily. And you have three primary blocks of information. You have your inputs and outputs, which is the project information sheet that you already saw. Uh, then you have the capital cost summary, your result summary, which you've already seen. And then you have your edit data. So the orange uh, or yellowish orange buttons, when you click on those, those will bring you to sheets that allow you to change um, any of the data within the system that is used to calculate the quantities and cost of the various systems. So you have the global data, the E1, uh, gravity, step, and vacuum data. Then you have a couple miscellaneous tabs, which well, one is print the result summary, which gives you a printout of the results. It's similar to what you saw in the summary uh, sheet, only formatted a little bit differently to facilitate the printing. And then the one you probably want to hit first is show all sheet tabs. And this will open up all the sheet tabs within the model. So from this page, let's go ahead and click on the capital cost summary. So you already saw the, capital, the overall summary. When you click on the capital cost summary, this brings you to the sheet that shows sort of the breakdown of that big number. Um, the capital cost summary displays the cost and breakdown of each alternatives for the selected evaluations. The cost summary table is pre-populated, excuse me, pre-populated with standard system components. So because we want to make this sort of based on very limited information, as well as be flexible, we kind of put the information sort of already in there and it assumes standard components. Um, so we'll jump to the next slide, and here we'll kind of go through these quickly that you can see. I don't want to spend too much time on the details, but you can see for um, you know the E1 pressure sewer system, we have uh, various pressure pipe of um, certain di diameters, two, three, four, five, and six diameters, air release valves, simplex pumps, duplex pumps, gravity sewer systems. It, assumes that everything's going to be 8 or 10 inch, as well as 12 inch. And then you have a line item for um, standard manholes, service lateral connections, and then three lift stations that we might have within the system. Uh, looking at the septic tank effluent pressure, pressure uh, sewer system, uh, you know, there's a lot of similarities between that and the E1 system the grinder pump system. So you see you have the pressure pipe that is uh, two to six inches, your air release valves, and then your on-property components such as your septic tank, pump, and effluent filter. And then on the vacuum, you know, you have standard components for vacuum. Four, six, eight, ten-inch vacuum pipe, uh, valve pits and basins, uh, laterals, and then um, uh, vacuum station with the vacuum sta with the vacuum system you have the vacuum station so it uses these standard components to kind of get you in the ballpark of the evaluation uh, you know there might be some modifications we can make if you want to add some particular user defined lines and you know one of the things I'll get to you know I'll mention now but we certainly can touch on later is this is set up that if you have something special you need we, you can contact us and we can work with you to modify this as necessary. So if this pre-populated table doesn't match your exact needs, it, we can work with you to get you something that you really want to, you know, that will help you. So when you look at the system, um, going back to the E1 pressure sewer system, we'll use that as our example. You have a, a couple columns. Um, you have the default, quant default quantities that are automatically calculated based on the number of connections and system-specific parameters that we'll get to uh, explain shortly. Uh, and then you have the pipelines and other um, system components. 
The cost model utilizes various industry standards, guidelines, and practices to estimate the quantity of sewer components. Uh, and these parameters are specific. And by this, we would mean you know, one manhole every 400 feet or an air release valve for a pressure sewer system every 200 feet. And there are the formulas within the model that calculate that out. So here you can see on the, um, the default value for this example has 9,000 uh, 135 feet of two-inch pipe, um, 11 air release valves. That's based on sort of what we, we set as some um, guidelines and standards. The initial cost for the cost summary is based on the location adjusted default unit cost. So there are default unit costs within here, and those costs are adjusted based on the zip code that is put into the system. Uh, and again, the unit costs are based on an analysis of numerous project bid tabs, estimates provided in engineering evaluations and reports, and our collective uh, personal experience. Uh, the model right now, the default cost will be considered to be a national average and in 2018 uh, dollars. Uh, then you also have your non-construction costs, and these include your uh, contingencies and uh, project costs. So the contingency is a percentage value that is based on the, um, the, the user decides what that percentage is, and it accounts for any of the unknowns within the system. Now, the contingency is provided to sort of improve the accuracy of the base estimate. So it wouldn't be unusual to have a high contingency in a project that is not well-defined, and as that project becomes better defined, you can lower that contingency, and you have the flexibility within this model to do that. Uh, then you have the project costs. This is what I mentioned earlier would be considered the um, project administration cost, construction administration cost, anything associated with executing the project other than the capital cost of the uh, furnished install and the components. This, again, is a user-defined percentage, and it is a percentage of both the project subtotal cost as well as the contingency. So one of the things that's important with our cost model is the flexibility. So both the quantities and the cost can be changed by the user. And you do this by clicking on the edit button on the top of the table. And that opens up the user-defined values sheet. And you can see on this sheet, it's very similar, has the same components uh, for each system that was on the cost summary sheets. But you have those two new columns that were added. So here, you, you, you can change the um, user-defined quantities and user-defined unit prices. So the user can change the system component quantities and the cost uh, that are used in the total cost calculation. And if you change, if you put a value in here and the user-defined cost is entered, this value will override the location-adjusted unit cost. Now, it's assumed that if you're putting in a number for the unit cost, you're basing it on your location. So it uses that number as opposed to the default value that is adjusted. Um, so let's see, on, the, on the capital cost, user-defined values, both the default values and the user-defined values are displayed. So on this sheet, if you put a number in that orange block, you would see, but this, this is for both the uh, quantities and the cost, you would see both values on this sheet. On the cost summary sheet, you will only see the one value. And on the capital cost summary page, that value displayed for both the quantity and the unit cost is either the default value if the user does not enter uh, a value or the user-defined value. So that gives you some flexibility in working with the, um, the model's default quantities as well as the unit costs that are uh, default to the system. And we have seen, you know, some users have, uh, have used this cost model where they already have a conceptual design done. So they know how much uh, linear footage of pipe they have and how many manholes and release valves they have. So they can start with this model, but then use that information to adjust it a little bit to their needs. So now we go back to the navigation dashboard where we have uh, the other buttons where the user has the full flexibility where you can change any of the system and cost parameters used in the cost model. And here I'm, I'm actually missing a bullet, but from this page you could edit the global data, the E1 data, the gravity data, the septic tank F1 pump data, 
or the vacuum system data. And what I'm going to do now is touch on sort of each of those in a kind of a brief overview, and then we'll hit on a couple of the, uh, let's say, critical ones or highlight ones. So the global parameters, these are fields that are common to all sewer systems in the life cycle cost evaluation. This is the real discount rate, so that's what you use to discount the future cost to the present worth value. Then you have a general inflation rate. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you have uh, two components, your contingency and your project cost. Those uh, can be changed by the user based on uh, you know what they want. In some cases, you may want to put zero project cost because you don't in your evaluation you don't want to you don't really want to include the cost of the project administration. You just want to look at capital and O and M. Or as I mentioned, with the contingency cost, you might have a higher value now, and then as you decide to move forward with your project and you get a little bit better definition, you can lower that contingency value. So those parameters would all be changed on this sheet. Then we'll go ahead and click on oh, – no, we won't click. We'll just move down a little. I'm, I apologize for that. You have the pipe allowance, which I mentioned. And then you have a typical service lateral length. So within the model, the service lateral length is calculated based on the number of connections. So you have this uh, typical lateral length. Obviously, every lateral is not going to be the same. So you could kind of put in an average number or adjust this. Uh, but this kind of allows us to move forward with the evaluation without having to really think about, well, how long is each individual lateral? Then you have your base wastewater flow as well as your infiltration and inflow allowance flow. Uh, these values are necessary when we look at the cost of transporting and treating infiltration and inflow into the system, as well as for the gravity sewer when we want to consider um, larger pipe diameters. So now we'll click on the gravity sewers. And it's, I'm just going to touch over some of the, um, the oh, kind of the big picture type stuff. But within the gravity sewer system, you have your system parameters, which is your pipe diameter, pipe thresholds, the number of sewer system overflows that you would expect on average, uh, manhole spacing, I kind of mentioned this earlier, where you might have 400 feet of uh, pipe between manholes, so every 400 feet you have a manhole, a lift station threshold, and then a component for erosion control, traffic control, and maintenance. Then you have your operation and maintenance um, parameters. And you know, one of the common misconceptions, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation of the webinar, was that once a gravity sewer system is installed, it's free. And that's not really the case. You're going to have as your as your gravity sewer uh, ages, you're going to have infiltration. You're going to want to do some regular inspection of the system, uh, regular smoke testing, uh, and cleaning of the system. So you have the parameters here where you could change those values. Um, and you know that though, how often you inspect or TV your system and clean your system is going to vary from system to system. Now I've I've talked with a lot of operators and utility directors, uh, and I ask them how often they inspect and clean the gravity sewer systems. And a very common answer I get is, how, do you want to know how often we do it or how often we want to do it? Uh, you know, it's easy to forego doing some stuff because we bury our best work with sewer systems. So this allows you, though, that you can capture that cost. And even if you don't necessarily do it, you know it's something that you should be doing. And if you capture that cost early on, you might be able to easily budget the money to make sure you do that critical cleaning and inspection as the systems go on. And then you have your O&M cost parameters. So this is just the cost for the inspection and cleaning and uh, lift station uh, annual maintenance cost and the uh, um, light cleaning and heavy cleaning. So yeah, as we kind of work through here, you can see that all these fields are orange. Everything that you're seeing in orange can be changed. So when you open the model, there are quantities in there and costs in there. Every single one of them can be changed. Every parameter that is used to calculate the quantities of the system and the cost of the system is user changeable. So now we'll look at the overview of the pressure sewer system model parameters. So the system parameters you have with the pressure sewer system that are considered in the uh, electrical cost model is the spacing of air release valves and clean outs in the system, the system percentage of simplex grinder pumps versus duplex grinder pumps, again, erosion control, traffic control. And we have that erosion control, traffic, and maintenance restoration there as a, a changeable field. 
because with a pressure sewer system, we would expect that number to be lower, that cost to be lower for a pressure sewer system than it would be for a gravity sewer system because you're going to have less disruption to the roads, less disruption to the community, uh, less disturbance, so your restoration is going to be lower. So you, you, we want to allow the user to change that throughout the system. And then you have your O&M parameters and cost. This is your uh, general system O&M, the annual grinder pump power cost. As I mentioned earlier, it's not normally included. Uh, and you can see here the default value, which is what we typically see is uh, $12 per year per installed pump. So when you open the model, and the default value does not include that $12, but on the project information sheet, you can select to include that. As I said, because it's such a low number, it's really not going to move the needle much on the evaluation. But we want to make sure that you have the flexibility to incorporate or not incorporate things as you see fit. And then you have the reactive maintenance. Uh, there is no preventive maintenance with the E1 grinder pump system. So you have the kind of the reactive maintenance as well as react to, I'm sorry, equipment replacement cost. And here, you know, this is where you might replace uh, a grinder pump every 20 years. So instead of having that at year 20, we assume that is broken down over the course of 15 or 20 years. So that re future replacement cost is spread out over an annualized basis. Then we'll look at the overview for the step sewer systems. As I mentioned, um, there's a lot of similarities between step sewer systems, septic effluent pump systems, and um, grinder pumps in that they both use small diameter pipes and they have an on-system component. Uh, in the case of a grinder pump system, you have the basin with the grinder pump. With the step system, you have the septic tank on the property with the effluent pump. So, you know, you have your air release valve and your clean-out space in that um, is, a, is a model parameter. And, you know, here, so it's saying every 2,000 feet, you have a air release valve. You'll notice these ones are grayed out. You can't change those because if you change those on the uh, E1 pressure sewer system, that change is going to be reflected on the step system. Um, that way, we, you know, we kind of maintain some continuity that if you have an air release valve every 2,000 feet on a grinder pump system, it makes sense that you're going to have an air release valve every 2,000 feet on a pressure sewer system. The hydraulics and the, you know, the, the um, two-phase flows of the concerns um, are going to vary. But then you start to look at some of the other O&M parameters where you have um, general system, the annual pump power, similar to um, the E1 grinder pump system where it's a, it's a low annual cost. Then you have your reactive maintenance and equipment reserve. Um, and then here, which is a little bit different that you don't have in the other systems, is you have the septic tank pumping and the um, preventive inspection and filter cleaning. Uh, that is a, is a cost you want to capture. How often you inspect the system, how often you uh, clean the filter, how often you pump out the septic tank. Because with the septic tank effluent pump system, you still have the solids that are maintained within the system. So that's a component, a cost component, that could have some variability in there. So you want to make sure that we could, um, you know, capture that cost. Then we have the uh, vacuum sewer. So the quick overview on the vacuum sewer, the system parameters that are used in the uh, model, is the uh, valve pit threshold. This is how many connections you have for each valve pit the number of division valves you have within the system based on the number of connections, um, and then the vacuum station, how many vacuum stations, which is based on the number of connections. And your O&M parameters are um, your O&M parameters, such as your vacuum station maintenance, how often you uh, uh, inspect and replace the valve and the controller, and then the power associated with the vacuum station. So before I get to kind of the questions, I want to touch on a couple, uh, go into a little bit more detail. But actually, before I do that, so these last few sheets, when we look at the system parameters and the O&M parameters, those are the parameters that are used to determine the quantity of components within the system and the cost of the operation and maintenance of those components. And as I mentioned, I really want to make sure this point gets across because we want to make sure that you, you, know, you have the flexibility. Every one of these orange cells could be changed. So something I want to hit on real quick when we talk about numbers, and let me see, yeah, I'll, I'll touch on this. So on the E1 sewer system, uh, typically the pipe is going to range in diameter from 2 inch to 8 inch. We've done an evaluation on a lot of um, designed and uh, constructed grinder pump sewer systems, and we found that more than 90% of the mainline pipe is 
generally four inch or less in diameter. So what we we did, we looked at the, the information and we, we compiled that and we took this table, what we're seeing here is um, some tables that we developed where we looked at a whole lot of, as I mentioned, um, grinder pump sewer systems where we looked at the number of connections and the distribution of various pipe diameters. From there, we were able to determine a best fit curve and a formula for that curve. And then you can see the table on the bottom right, that is sort of a distribution. So what this cost model does is if you put in 200, and you may not be able to see it in detail, but if you put in uh, 200 connections, based on our historic information, we would estimate that about 40% of that pipe in the system is going to be two inch diameter, 35% uh, might be three inch diameter. So this is how we do the initial assessment of um, the breakdown of the sewer system pipe for the pressure sewer systems. As I said, when, you know, all the pipe, the total pipe quantity is based on the number of connections, and that's going to be the same for um, every every um, uh, every system. But for the uh, E1 pressure sewer system, the septic tank effluent pump system, and the vacuum system, we have these distribution models that we look at to determine various pipe diameters. Um, and then, you know, one of the things I mentioned going back to the gravity sewers, the thro flow thresholds. So the model assumes that all the mainline pipe is going to be 8 inch in diameter. But as the flow increases, we might want to incorporate some larger diameter trunk sewers and interceptors into the system. And that, what the, that is what the flow threshold is. So when the default values say on flow threshold number one, when you have 50,000 gallons per day, you're going to add 10%, which is flow threshold factor number one, 10% of the po total pipe quantity as an 8-inch trunk sewer. And the same would be for a 12-inch uh, interceptor sewer. At 106,000 gallons per day, you're going to add 205. And then similar thing for the uh, lift station, that once you have uh, 250 connections, your lift station thresholds, as you have more connections, you're going to start to add um, – small, medium, and larger lift stations. So these are user-defined parameters, uh, and the lift stations, as I said, is based on the number of connections. So there's certainly a lot more information um, that you, you would you know, go into. And as you down, when you download the model, we have a uh, user manual as well that you know, goes into a lot more of the details than we can really present in a uh, one-hour presentation. So I kind of want to wrap it up to make sure we have some time for you all's questions. But when we look at life cycle cost analysis, it becomes you know, kind of uh, viable that uh, pressure sewer systems are a viable alternative to conventional gravity sewers and sewer system alternatives. And because of you know, limited past experience and knowledge, uh, there might be misconceptions that in adversely impact the collection system evaluation. So by using a life cycle cost analysis, the owner, the engineer, operator, or any real stakeholder can look at both the long-term and uh, uh, the near-term capital cost as well as the long-term cost. Um, as I mentioned, the life cycle cost model is a free tool available from E1 that you can download from our website. Uh, this provides a long term planning level comparison of different sewer alternatives. And the key feature that we, we really want to kind of set up with this, it allows for the quick what if when you put in very little information, but then once you get that information, you can say, well, what if I change the space into that? Or what if I want to add 50 more connections? And you could do a whole lot of what if scenarios by changing the parameters and look at it quickly. So it allows you to really kind of see what you're able to accomplish. Uh, with your with your with the um, you know perhaps limited funding, you know some people have used this model. Once they looked at it, they realized because of the cost savings that they would see with the pressure sewer systems, um, they would be able to incorporate a larger service area. So then they were able to go back to the cost model, put in more connections, and then see okay what's that uh, cost estimate going to be. And the key part is we really want to make sure that uh, we have that user flexibility that gets rid of any, um, any of that bias that or, or, you know, gets, uh, allows you to adjust the system as you need to. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Andrew. And we can, um... All right, Keith. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, great, great presentation. Um, we have a bunch of questions coming in. Uh, 
first off, and I think you started to to kind of address some of this at the end there, but uh, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure a lot of people must be thinking, or I'm sure you guys you know tend to get questions on this, but you know the model that E1 has developed seems like it, it might have a bias toward pressure sewer systems. You know how how would you uh, address that? Yeah, that, that that is uh you know certainly something that we wanted to make sure that we addressed straight up because we developed this as a tool to um you know help the engineering community the wastewater community do the evaluations because although we're you know coming up on our 50th anniversary so we're still a very young um uh industry in the pressure sewer business a lot of people aren't familiar with it so we want to provide this tool to allow them to make the decisions but we did not want to give them something that says, okay, well, here's the model that we developed, and it's always going to come up with E1 on top. I mean, every as I went through, and hopefully, you know, everyone kind of understood, pretty much every parameter, every cost, every component can be changed. So if you disagree with our what we see as defensible default values, you are you know have the flexibility to change any of those values. Uh, and that's both regional too. I mean, maybe something that you know we see here, you might see differently in your region. So we like to think that because we offer the model has the flexibility to change everything pretty much, that will eliminate any of the bias. Now, unfortunately, you know, if you if you think we're having a bias, you might just find that no matter how many times you change the numbers to something that you find is defensible, pressure sewer system is still going to look good from a uh, life cycle cost perspective. Okay. So let's let's get into the life cycle cost a little bit. Can you talk about uh you know what are some of the big drivers uh you know in the the cost difference between pressure sewer systems and other alternatives like you know conventional gravity and and others. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll focus really on the for for you know mainly time wise just comparing it to like a gravity sewer system. You know when when we looked at the components of the two systems you know, we had with the pressure sewer, the E1 pressure sewer system, uh, pipe diameter, flexible pipe, ranging from two inch to four inch, buried just below the frost line. Compare that to an eight inch gravity sewer that's going to be buried at a deeper depth, having to maintain a constant downward slope, and the potential that as you go deeper, you're going to have to install some lift stations. Just by having the um, the, the smaller diameter pipe, the faster construction period that comes with that, buried just below the frost line. We tend to see uh, across the industry, not just the one systems, but everything, uh, a pressure sewer system typically be a 40% cost savings over conventional gravity sewer. So a lot of that you're eliminating in most cases, you're eliminating major lift stations, you have a faster construction period, lower you know, flexible pipe uh, that's going to be buried just below the frost line. So that right there is, is a really the big component in terms of what you would expect to see uh, as that it would be the big driver on the cost savings of a um, pressure sewer system over a gravity sewer system. Okay. Can E1's life cycle cost model be modified at all? Um, let's see. How, 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 uh, the, the quick answer is yes. If you want to make a modification, it can't be modified by the user. But we will be happy to work with you um, or work with the user to modify it uh, that they see it fit. As I, you know, I, I mentioned it, and you know, it might have been um, not knows or kind of glossed over, is on the um, – let me just jump up. On the capital construction cost sheets, I don't know where they are. Um, I apologize. There we go. You know, on these sheets, we have, uh, what is it, like 10 or 12 pre-populated cells. I've already modified for some users this spreadsheet where there are five lines under the uh, system components where they can put in whatever system components they do. We've, we were working with some engineers who uh, had some stuff already. They did a preliminary design. They had some components that weren't part of our standard pre-populated. So we were able to work with them and modify it. So... The user themselves are not able to modify this, but we would be happy to work with you, you know, on that modification. And one thing, you know, kind of leading off of that question, um, I noticed that in their webinar we had a lot of uh, international registrants. And as you're looking at this webinar, you're probably seeing everything in feet and U.S. dollars. 
so this is uh, you know kind of right now what I would call the domestic value uh, the domestic version, but we certainly can modify it for any Canadian or other uh, international customers. Uh, you know it has unit cost in there, and right now I don't have a good unit cost for other areas. So if you do want to incorporate it into an area or you do want to modify it, please give me a call, drop me an email, and we can work with you to make that modification. Yeah, Keith, uh, we did get a couple questions on that, on, on whether or not the uh, the units can be adjusted to, to metrics, but uh, so, so thanks for addressing that. Um, will the uh, life cycle model provide useful cost information if the sewer system design details are not fully developed? Yeah, absolutely. The, the entire purpose of this is to get that uh, useful comparative analysis if you don't have any information. As I say, you, the first pass, number of connections and distance between connections. And then, you know, th that gives you sort of the uh, starting point. And then as you develop the model, then you can go into the uh, user-defined sheet and override the quantities that are in there. So, yes, absolutely. The, the, the purpose of this would be uh, to start with very little information and at least give you that uh, open-in um, uh, evaluation. Okay, and does the life cycle cost include the power cost for each individual grinder pump station? Yes, there, there, within the um, the um, within the parameters that you could select for the uh, sewer systems, each individual sewer systems, there is. Uh, let's see if I'm on the yeah, I'll jump to that sheet right now. It does have the cost down on you know second from the bottom on um, the sewer system parameter sheet, the power cost for each individual uh, grinder pump. But as I said, the default value is that that is not included in the life cycle cost analysis. But you can select the button on the project information sheet that says include that cost. So there is a parameter to capture that cost, and then another uh, selection that the user can decide to include that cost in the life cost evaluation or not include that cost. And as I said, you know, we have it as the default value is no, because that cost is typically picked up by the homeowner. Okay, and I, I think this next question is kind of in, in reference to this, uh, kind of a follow-up to that also, but are, are engineering and inspection costs also included? That would fall under the project uh, cost, which is a percentage, one of those percentage values. And we, we keep that sort of as a, um, a wide berth percentage because everyone's going to have a different idea on what they want to include. So we just have it set up as a percentage of the uh, project cost. Okay, now when we talk about the project's useful life, uh, what does that mean exactly? How, how would you, you know, define that? What, you know, what do you consider as, as a project's useful life? Well, you know, there's probably a couple different ways to look at a project's useful life. Um, you really want to look at it in terms of you want you want to capture as much as you can. So, you know, I said earlier that in my experience, I like to work between a project evaluation period of 20 to 40 years. And in many cases, the lending agency might dictate what that project life is. Now, if you have a, a you know pipe in the ground, the useful life of a pipe in the ground, particularly a plastic pipe in the ground could be 100 years or more. Uh, you know, any one pipe grinder pump basin could have a useful life of you know, 20 years with some uh, repair and replacement, maybe somewhere in between that. So that the light, useful life of the um, equipment and the components and everything else is going to vary. Uh, but when we look at the life cycle cost analysis, we talk about the planning period of the evaluation. We want to look at what those costs would be over a dis uh, discrete area or discrete time frame. And as I said, in many cases that will be driven by um, the lending agency. If, you know, if you're putting out a 30-year bond, your planning period wants to be 30 years because you want to make sure you have uh, the funding capability to pay back that bond. Uh, and if you go, you know, you, you're making a lot of assumptions. And if you start to go too far out beyond four years, those assumptions become kind of, uh, you know, really fuzzy. And if you start to look too close, like less than 20 years of the planning period, you're not capturing all the true costs associated with it. So when we look at the planning period, it's not so much the life of the equipment and the components. It's how long do we really want to look at um, 
the life cycle cost evaluation, what planning period. And every, you know, there are going to be different opinions, but typically you'll see it between 20 to 40 years, 40 years. Okay. Now, for the calculator, uh, we have a question that came in here uh, on the calculator. It appears that the minimum number of sewer laterals uh, usable is 50. Is there a reason that the minimum limit is set at that number, or? Yeah, we just, we, you know, we kind of looked at, we want something that, um, let's say, kind of mirror what we would expect to see. And typically, when you're starting to look at uh, systems like that, uh, when you start to get too low or too high, it can skew the data. So I don't know that there's any real reason, but it was just to kind of cut down or kind of minimize the, the calculation uh, iteration process. If so, you know, and I, I, you know um, if, if there is someone who wants to look at this um, for a, if there is someone who wants to look at if, uh, you know, something less than 50 connections, they can, um, you know, certainly get in touch with us and we can make that modification for them. And uh, we just put up the thank you sheet, which has my contact information on it. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll, do, we'll go through two more questions, Keith. Uh, first, can you, can you provide costs of providing a package treatment plan as part of the overall wastewater system? I cannot provide that really right now, I and mean, that's really going to vary. If there's a, you know, a, a right. if someone has a, a specific question, they can contact either E1 or uh, E1's uh, distribution partners, because we would need a little bit more information to kind of really, you know, give them a cost. But if they contact E1 or E1's distribution partners, we can work with them on sort of developing some of that cost information. So that's that's something that you probably could do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, lastly here, uh, we had a question come in. Uh, this person says, you know, I, I work for a, a wastewater treatment uh, utility. Um, we have a life cycle analysis tool that is designed to handle any type of capital project. We like to differentiate capital from O&M costs. Annualizing replacement costs can affect the true net present value of the overall analysis. What's sort of your your theory behind that approach? Can you talk, can you talk about that at all? Um, yeah, I think I think a lot of that when you you know this is what we developed is kind of a tool to help uh, the user make a decision on which way they want to go. But if they're looking as a utility that has to answer or has to provide certain information to uh, their lending agency or maybe even their customers. Uh, you know, you mentioned that they they said uh, net present value, so that you know, as I mentioned earlier, the difference between net present value and present worth would be the salvage value, which this doesn't include salvage value. I suppose you could put in a negative number. Uh, so yeah, it sounds like that qu the, that questionnaire has a lot more information that they're needed to um, provide to uh, somebody, like say maybe the lending agency or their authority. Whereas our model is really set up just to kind of do that initial um, assessment. So it maybe doesn't go into as much detail as they might be using, but it does give you a good tool to use to compare various sewer systems to, to make that initial uh, um, evaluation. All right. Well, uh, Keith, we are at the hour mark, so uh, I will go ahead and uh, start the wrapping up. Uh, we, great presentation. I uh, really appreciate your time. And uh, um we uh, we still have some questions coming in, uh, so for all of our attendees still on with us, uh, we will make sure that uh, you know our presenters uh, you know work to get those answered offline, uh, so we can we can get those to you. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and uh, conclude the session of the uh, Water Finance Management Webinar Series. Thanks for everyone uh, for joining us this afternoon, and thanks again, Keith, uh, for your presentation, and thanks to E1 for for sponsoring this session. Uh, as a reminder, uh, the webinar will be archived uh, on our website, which is www.waterfm.com. If there is something you missed or would like to refer back to, um, so uh, with that, uh, we'll go ahead and sign off and look forward to having everyone uh, back on the next webinar. Okay. And th thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you.